Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern-day treasure hunters. <laughs> yeah, baby! They travel the world in search of meteorites. Holy Moses! Alien invaders that have been crashing into our planet for the last four and a half billion years. Oh, blasted right over here. On this expedition, Watch it. Jeff and Steve hit Chile to take on the ancient Monturaki meteorite crater. <laughs> it does exist. Almost 10,000 feet up in the Atacama Desert. The altitude and the fatigue are really getting to me because there's not enough oxygen getting through. The guys hunt two meteorite-rich areas. 32 meteorites were found somewhere in that area. We want to look for number 33. And a top-secret location. If I'd found 30-odd meteorites in one zone, I wouldn't publish the coordinates for everyone in the world to see. Despite the deadly roads and unforgiving conditions, Steve and Jeff bag a big space rock. Whoa! No way! Yeah! Jeff and Steve are in northern Chile hunting for the big one that got away 13 years ago. The Montoraki Crater one of only 13 craters on Earth that produces iron meteorites. Montaraki is one of the top three sites in the world I most want to see. But getting there is half the battle. Wow, these roads are just getting rougher and rougher. Their first Montaraki attempt failed miserably because at the time there were no roads and the surrounding cliffs were too high to climb. I've always considered our failure to find Montaraki Crater on our 1997 expedition to be the biggest failure of my career, really. It's something that interests me so much, not just because it's a well-preserved crater, but because it's so remote and that it produces impactites and small iron fragments. And to have the opportunity to hunt there or camp there even better. Scientists estimate that over 100,000 years ago, a 4,000-pound meteorite smashed into Earth. Upon impact, it vaporized almost completely. However, it's believed that tiny fragments of the meteorite might still be scattered all around the edge of the crater. If pieces remain, they would be considered extremely valuable. I think there's only been two or three pounds total of the meteorite material recovered. I didn't think I'd ever make it back to this country. I'm so glad for the opportunity to finally visit the crater and, and do some more hunting. Yeah. Welcome to Bakidanya. The small town of Bakidano is the only stop before the crater. So, do you want to stop and, in my broken Spanish, try and get some directions? Think anyone here knows where we're going? Oh. We should get wine. Alcoholes. That's good. That's a good start. That's one. We've stopped in this charming little desert town called Bacidano, and it's the last bit of civilization before the remote road to Monteraki Crater. They're cooking something. Oh, it smells good. If we can get sandwiches, what do you want? Ham sandwich or something. I don't know what the Spanish for ham is. Pig. <laughs> Yo, what? Hamburger. Mm. Fajita. Burrito. Okay. Enchilada. Um, I know a lot of Spanish. It's very amusing to travel in a Spanish speaking country with Steve. <laughs> he freely admits that he doesn't speak or understand Spanish, but he then pretends to. How do you say? Can we get it to go in Spanish? Like, get it to go, Sean? Oh, Colin, you're being <laughs> silly now. It's kind of amusing the first million times. No, 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 no. Uh, I don't like it. Shut up and eat your sandwich. Oh. All right, so here's what we got so far. Well, we know where we are now. How's it feel to be so close? Um, exciting. That truck just set off the car alarm. 
After finishing their meal, Jeff and Steve check directions with the locals. Por favor, uh, a blind place? Nada. No? Nada? Nada. Parlez vous français? No. <laughs> I've spent most of my life in England and the States. I've traveled in Europe a lot. My French is pretty good. I speak a little Russian. My Spanish is poor at best. And nobody here speaks English. Um, uh, por favor, um, lo siento, um, um, y, um, um, estamos, uh, el cráter Monteraki. No con eso? No, no, no. I knew I should have uh, taken Spanish in high school instead of Latin. Um, Estamos el cráter meteorito, Monteraki, um, a próxima peine. Peine, ah. Peine. Es esto. Sí. Se arriba. Se fija. Okay. Is this, is this was shorter? Um, Esta. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah, let's go es, short. Es, um, uh, es peligrosa aquí? Sí. Ahí. Okay, so it's Peligrosa. means danger. These roads, they, they can build them and tear them down at will any time. The mining companies do it to, to get to the shortest route. Uh, I'm hoping there's going to be a road there still. Last time we couldn't get to it because the cliffs were too high and there wasn't a road. Hopefully the road's still there. Hopefully we can get there before sunset. But we're seriously running out of daylight. Yes. We got to set up our tent and start getting warm because as soon as that sun drops, the temperature drops 20 or 30 degrees, the wind comes up. If you don't have shelter, we're toast. These guys are maniacs. Well, all I know is I want to get there in one piece. It will take over five hours of white knuckle driving on rough roads primarily designed for huge mining vehicles. You'd think that the profusion of shrines along the roads would cause drivers to be a little bit more cautious. On some of the main roads, you, you can't go two minutes without seeing a memorial to people who were killed in that very spot. And yet, Chileans drive with great speed and recklessness. The roads are poorly maintained and lack guardrails. All it takes is one wrong move. I really hate to have a Jeff and Steve memorial out here. Can you imagine having a blowout on a rough road like this? You could lose control and just roll it. Oh, watch it. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold are in Chile navigating their way through dangerous roads to reach the Monteraki meteorite crater. Monteraki is one of the top three sites in the world I most want to see. As they drive deeper into the Atacama Desert, the roads become more treacherous. Oh, watch it. Oh, watch out. This is really rough. and little daylight left, the guys are forced to abandon their plan to make it to the crater. The Atacama Desert is no place to be stuck at night. Well, I've been waiting 13 years. I suppose I can wait one more day. Let's see if we can find somewhere to stay. And get some food. Painting. 429 habitantes. Oh. Wow, it's like a ghost town. Hostel pub. That's hotel, right? Yeah. Loss. Look at the kitty. Uh, Hi, kitty. 
You know, you might be freaking someone out oh. by doing that. Oh, no. oh, yeah, I was. Hostile. Are you sure that doesn't mean hostile? It might be. There's one way to find out. Whoa. Hola. Buenas noches. Uh, hola, tiene habitación, señor? What was that? I don't know. I don't know if that means no, he doesn't have any or no, he didn't like the look of us. Did you hear what he said? No, I didn't understand. He just closed well, the door. let's go see if there's another place, I guess. I don't know. There's a sign on this building. What? Hola. Hola. I guess that would be a double no. Is my Spanish really that bad that people just slam the door the minute I start? Yeah, or maybe you stick your head in the window and say so, they're a cat. Well, this looks sharp. Hola. Tiene habitación? Oh, yes. Excellent. <laughs> We're very tired, and we've been looking for a long time. Is this is your place? Oh, yes. <laughs> The guys get up at the crack of dawn, refreshed and ready to hunt the Monturaki crater. Today's the big day. We're ready to hit the road and go dig meteorites. That's what we're here for. Bye, Penny. Yay. Well, we're starting to go up. My ears are pumping. According to the map, the rest of the two-hour trip will be off-road. This might be it up here on the horizon. It's calling me. It's just up there. I can feel it. I can feel it. You still want to camp out here? Yeah, if we can find the crater, I still want to camp out here. bigger than I imagined. Welcome to Monterey! Wow. <laughs> it does exist. Check it out. This is just stunning. You're already down looking for impactites? Or are you praying, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> I just had to stop and savor the moment. It is nice. This is where our world interfaces with the cosmos. This is what happens when we run into asteroids. Perched way up here on this shelf is one of 13 craters on our planet. And there's still meteorites laying around it. You can sit here and look at this all you want. Enjoy the view. I'm gonna go find some meteorites. So we have a chance of finding impactites and iron fragments. Yes. Even though the event that formed the crater took place 100,000 years ago, we still find small meteorite fragments and impactite fragments. Impactites are earth rocks that have been transformed or altered by a meteorite impact. In other words, a large meteorite hits the earth and the heat and the pressure generated by that impact transform the rocks at the site where the meteorite landed. I would have expected the impactites to be fairly abundant. Well, they... Here's one. I don't know if there's... Well, just, yeah, it's just it this. barely attracts. So how does that differ from the Earth's rock? <laughs> it's pretty close, isn't it? It really is. But this is about the size most of them are. Some a little bigger, some a little smaller. It's got a slightly grayish cast to it. So and you just got to tune your eye into it. Here's one. Okay, that looks a bit more recognizable. That's much more gray. And you didn't see the little bubbles in it? Okay, you have to go back to the truck now until I find it. Oh, thing. do I? We should make a little wager. 
See who uh, finds the most. Why is everything a competition with you? Competition's a good thing. Oh, okay. Is this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I'm Sleeping happy. A little? Yes. All right. It's a really yeah. exciting moment when I find the first piece at a new location. It'll always be in my collection. It just makes me as happy as could be. I'm just a big science geek. So this is a piece of the Monteraki Impactite, and the Monteraki Impactite is particularly interesting because they're tiny pieces of the original meteorite frozen inside it. And my very first piece weighs 13.6 grams. Well, <laughs> that's not one. I found an impact wrong. Nice. There, right there. So these little guys, you're not gonna be able to retire on them, but you get enough of them, it makes the trip worth the while. Of course, I think Jeff just finding one made his trip all worth his while. Oh, look at this. That's cool. Jeff and Steve are in Chile, hunting for valuable impactites in the Monteraki meteorite crater. There's one, another one. Oh, this one's cool. But Jeff has made an even greater discovery. Oh, wow. I wasn't expecting that. That's a piece of the actual meteorite. That's exciting. This meteorite landed here 100,000 years ago, making Monteraki one of the oldest known meteorites on Earth. It's one of only about 12 or 13 craters on the surface of the Earth that have produced iron meteorites. And only a tiny amount has ever been found. I mean, just a few ounces. So it's actually one of the rarest iron meteorites on Earth. And it's a whopping 1.2 grams. That's one of only a, a handful of pieces that are known. Oh, holy Moses! This is a piece of shale. This is a piece of the meteorite. This is not impactite. Some scientists call remaining pieces of the actual meteorite shale because the weathered fragments look similar to common terrestrial rocks. This is like probably the biggest one I've ever found. With less than an hour left to hunt, Jeff pulls out his homemade meteorite hunting tool. So what we have here is a magnet rake and the purpose of this device is to carry a lot of super powerful magnets that we use to drag across the surface and see if we can get hidden meteorites to adhere. Oh, this is great. There's a little meteorite fragment right there. And there's another one. Well, Edison, how's it going? Since I started using this about 20 minutes ago, here's what I found. Oh, my goodness. That's all shale. Yep. Wow! Since I've started using the magnet rake, I found more meteorite fragments than in our whole expedition put together. We actually have a set price in the market, $20 a gram. I've got 450 grams here, so we're looking at $9,000 of fragments here. It's been a dream of mine to visit the Monteraki Crater for well over a decade. And just seeing it was a fantastic experience. And really, I would have been happy to just come home with a few pieces, but we made an extraordinary haul. After a day of hunting the crater, Jeff and Steve have recovered $11,000 worth of impactites and impact tours. Happiness is a full bucket of meteorites. After a successful hunt, Steve and Jeff drive into the middle of the crater to realize Jeff's greatest meteorite dream, sleeping overnight inside the Montoraki. Well, it is. <laughs> wow. It's so much bigger on the inside. It is. This is great. 
This is the best campsite ever. In the whole, in the history of the world. Yeah. It's not very often that you get to say that a dream's come true, but this is a dream come true for me. Sitting around a fire on the floor of the Montaraki meteorite crater. I think we found enough stuff today, you know, to pay for the trip. Oh, yeah. Which is good. I mean, this would have been worth the trip just for the experience and find a piece or two. It's a return to Chile, which was the site of our very first expedition together 13 years ago. <laughs> I'm glad we did it again. Me too. Cheers. Cheers. And my toes are getting cold, so I think I'm going to turn into my right. tent. And we'll see what the new day brings. Good night. All right. Sleep well. Are you going to sleep with your impact bikes? Yeah. I thought you would. Steve's a really great guy to travel with. There aren't really many people in the world that would come out to a place like this with me in the freezing cold on the rim of a crater collecting little tiny black rocks. Most people would think we were completely insane, but to us it's just normal. Well, this should be interesting. Are you gonna take this exit? Off the crater wall at full speed. Well, that's a stupid question. <laughs> He's really going all out, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to hit the jump at top speed. If anyone can do it, it's this amazing driver from the American Midwest. He's just going up there at top speed. He's not slowing down for anything. Is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? Good God, look at that. Woohoo! <laughs> nice. That was better than a roller coaster. With $11,000 in Montaraki fines, Jeff and Steve head back to Chile's west coast for a tour of the Paranal Observatory. I imagine some of the top astronomers in the world are probably here right now. Here, they'll get a rare opportunity to see meteorite craters in outer space through one of the most advanced telescope systems in the world. Oh, wow. Telescope buildings. I hope they have good food here. Hello. Hey, how are you? Dr. Dimas. Good to see you. Welcome to Panal. Thank you. OK, I'm going to show you around. Excellent. Electronic images are gathered through the four main telescopes with optical mirrors almost nine yards in diameter. I'm finding it so inspiring that we're here at a facility that's designed to look up into space and illustrate where the meteorites that we're searching for actually come from. Up to three of the telescopes can work together to form one giant telescope, aptly named the VLT, or Very Large Telescope. I'm an amateur astronomer. I have two telescopes at home, but my telescope, my biggest one, is probably about one thousandth of the size of the monster telescopes that are up there. OK, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. All right. Hey. The sun's beginning to set. I know the doors are going to be opening on the observatory soon, and I am just dying to get up there and, and see everything in action. All right, OK, so there's more. You have to go up, go the floor. So let's go in. <laughs> so welcome to uh, the Yipun Telescope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> Jeff and Steve are on the west coast of northern Chile, getting a tour of the Paranal Observatory. Oh, wow. Telescope buildings. But as they enter the inner workings of the very large telescope, <gasps> <We're moving. Oops. laughs> things take an exciting turn. Oh. <laughs> as the sun sets, the telescopes are positioned for evening observation. OK, so now you're going to see the primary mirror very close. If you break the mirror, do you have seven years of bad luck? I think more than that. More than <laughs> that? <laughs> OK. Plus, you have to find another job. OK. <laughs> so now we're opening the dome. We also open some flaps. OK. In order to, to, to have a laminar closer. flow of uh, oh, yeah. okay, inside the dome and uh, avoid turbulences. What a fantastic sight. Dr. Dumas invites the guys to look at images from the VLT. Back when I was in California, I was using the Keck Observatory uh, to image uh, the biggest asteroid called Ceres. So uh, if we received meteorites from Ceres, we'd expect them to be chondrites? Probably carbonaceous, carbonaceous oh, really? chondrites. 
A carbonaceous chondrite is a very primitive class of meteorite, rich in amino acids and other organic compounds that are the building blocks for life. Scientists have theorized that such meteorites could have seeded the Earth with the ingredients necessary to begin the first living cells on our planet. You know, there is one of the you know, big theory now is that uh, the water on Earth itself uh, was maybe not necessarily brought by the comets, as we initially thought, but maybe by these kind of asteroids. Dr. Dumas also shares photos of meteorite craters on other planets. Uh, I like this picture because oh, wow. it's, a, it's a chain of craters. A chain of impact craters. Chain of impact. And so we, we do believe, OK, that these craters happen at the same time, OK? Yeah. Stringfield. Exactly. Uh, another kind of impact that happened on, uh, on Jupiter yeah, happened actually recently. And uh, these impacts of, of the, the fragments of the comets onto Jupiter created these uh, marks onto the surface. Mm -hmm. So they were actually big enough Okay, not only to, uh, uh, to burn up in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, but to go deep. As soon as this was observed by these astronomers, we actually uh, tried to see the, you know, the, the scar, okay, made on, on, onto the, the atmosphere of Jupiter by this impact that we could find. So, no results is still a result, okay? What does it tell us? It tells us that this object was probably small, just a few meters big, and it burned up entirely in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. It's a fantastic tour of our solar system. Yes, Thank you so yes, much. You're it's, very welcome. We get to talk about meteorites a lot, but we don't get to talk very much about where they come from. Yeah. yeah. Inspired by their tour of Paranal, Steve and Jeff head south to the coastal city of Tal Tal to plan their next hunt. The guys are excited over recently published coordinates of a whopping 32 meteorites recovered in the San Juan region of Chile. New meteorites have been coming out of the San Juan area for about a decade, and over 30 different meteorites have been found of different types. I don't mean 30 specimens from the same fall. These are 30 completely different meteorites that were found in a relatively small area. A meteorite from a unique fall is very rare. The guys are excited by the possibility of making an original find. I pulled up San Juan on uh, Google Earth. OK. We've got, what, 31? meteorites all with exactly the same coordinates right and most of them are different types but the coordinates are not precise and list the 32 meteorites as being found in a general area of a few square miles some meteorite hunters will list generic or even false coordinates to throw others off the trail well i'm a bit of a skeptic and i don't believe for a minute that that's the real gps coordinate i think if, if i'd found 30 odd meteorites in one zone in a period of a few years, I wouldn't publish the coordinates for everyone in the world to see. They may have just thrown a dart into a, into a map at random and said, let's just say we found them here. Right. So I have no problem starting at the find location as published, but I don't for a minute think that's the real spot. Okay. Jeff and Steve use the published location only as a starting point. From there, they will trust their meteorite hunting instincts to make their own San Juan find. 32 meteorites were found somewhere in that area. We want to look for number 33. I'm excited to check out the San Juan. Well, it certainly will be interesting to visit the so-called most densely populated meteorite zone in the world. This is true. It's like the New York of strewn fields. A strewn field is created when a meteoroid enters Earth's atmosphere and breaks into pieces. The mid-air fragmentation creates an ellipse pattern where the pieces land. Only four of the 32 meteorites found match with others, representing the only true strewn field in San Juan. The remaining 28 are not paired with other meteorites, so they're listed as unique finds. Uh, GPS is 15.9 miles. Using GPS coordinates, Jeff and Steve match the terrain and pinpoint the heart of the strewn field. All right, so here's a photo of the first San Juan rock in situ. The ground looks similar, but it's a bit more yellow in this photo. Mm -hmm. And okay. these, what about these mountains? I don't really. I mean, if you're rounding up to these coordinates, I don't know exactly how far away you could be. And but I mean, we are be... on them, like on them within six inches <laughs> right now. And then that just leads to the question, were those coordinates accurate? And, and I would think there's, there's some ground that's a little bit better than this. Look at those tracks over there. 
Look how heavily traveled it is. There have been a ton of people out here. Yep. The abundance of tire tracks is a clear indication that this area has already been well hunted. I think we need to do what's not obvious here. Well, let's drive around and see if we happen to find any place that doesn't have a lot of tire marks. Okay. That's a good place to start. Works for me. Well, The high altitude begins to take its toll on Jeff, but he fights through the fatigue. Hey, I really like this surface, and I'm not seeing any footprints here. Okay. And the San Juan hunt begins. What we're looking for are stone meteorites, the most abundant type of meteorites that fall on Earth. And they're going to be extremely dark. That's because they've acquired a fusion crust while flying through the Earth's atmosphere and burning. Almost all meteorites contain iron, so in addition to being very dark, they're gonna stick to a magnet. And I've got a very powerful rare earth magnet on the end of this stick. Stone meteorites are the most abundant of the three main groups of meteorites, stones, irons, and stony irons. Most stone meteorites were once part of the outer crust of an asteroid in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Collisions cause fragments to fly off, travel through space. From time to time, our planet encounters some of that debris. They burn in the atmosphere. They land stone meteorites on the ground. Since 95% of the stones have enough metal in them, enough iron, the magnets will pick them up. Now, there's been a carbonaceous chondrite found here. Odds are there's very little or no metal in it. It's important to remember that meteorites can be any size. I mean, we found giant meteorites in our career. We've also found tiny ones. But uh, you gotta stay focused. Or are you gonna miss it? They don't make it easy. They don't jump up and go, hey, I'm here. You've gotta ferret them out like a weasel. No way! Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold are hunting a meteorite hotspot in the Atacama Desert in Chile. 32 meteorites were found somewhere in that area. We want to look for number 33. And Jeff has stumbled upon something very promising. Ooh. It doesn't stick strongly enough. It's an earth rock, it's got a bit of iron in it. Well, it really looks like a meteorite, especially from a distance. <sighs> this one's kind of tough. It, it had a dark black Exterior. You'd almost think it might be crust, but it's not. For some reason, there's been a varnish, desert varnish grow on this one. If there was a fist sized meteorite sitting on this surface, There'd be no way you can miss it. No way. So I'm looking really. Oh, well, there's a dark something up there. And one right there, and one right there. So I'm gonna go check these couple out. So this is kind of tough, especially walking uphill. The ground's soft, it takes a little bit extra to pull your feet out and take the next step. So I don't think this ground's been searched well, so it's worth the extra effort to get up the hill. Yeah. Shadow. Not even close. The 
altitude and the fatigue are really getting to me is because there's not enough oxygen getting through. A whole lot of nothing. <sighs> Got a sore throat and my eyes are running and uh, some sort of nasal inflammation and I can't hear anything out of my left ear. I feel like Lawrence of Arabia out here. Should have some headgear on or something. But I won't find anything sitting down. I'm gonna head up to this hill area to see what I can see. And it's also a little lighter color, which I'd rather hunt on the lighter colored material. Jeff and Steve are hiking the hilly, windy, and dry San Juan region of the Atacama Desert. The altitude and the fatigue are really getting to me. They're in search of stone meteorites, and so far, they haven't found anything. Whoa! Until now. I think I just found one! I'm out walking on the flat area here, feeling a bit down, and uh, don't have a whole lot of energy. And I'm actually starting to wonder what the heck's happened to Steve, because I haven't seen him for ages. <laughs> this is a stone meteorite. There's a little bit of an attraction, not much. Concave on the back side, nose cone on this side. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is just the perfect ground to hunt. The perfect ground to hunt. And this thing just was sticking out. I, I saw it from 30 or 40 feet away, and I probably could have seen it farther away if I had just turned the truck, and there it was. It's like, oh, this is too easy. There's someone out there that probably would buy this as is for, for $2,500. Now, if it's a rare type, it'd be worth more probably in slices. And of course, there are some little places here where we can get a little piece off to get it tested to find out if it is a rare type. It is just so awesomely beautiful. Steve's big find is not a carbonaceous chondrite, but it's a great example of an oriented meteorite. As a meteoroid travels through the Earth's atmosphere, the intense heat will melt material off the rock. This process is called ablation. If the meteoroid maintains a stable flight rather than spinning, the space rock will ablate evenly, creating a shield or nose cone. These are known as oriented meteorites, and they're coveted by meteorite collectors. Sides of an oriented meteorite will usually have flow lines in the surface where the material melted away. The melting material rolls over toward the back of the meteoroid, with the rear edges creating a lip. Um, fresh tracks here. That's probably where Steve went. Uh, or to the moon, who knows with that guy. Could be anywhere. Over the top of the highest mountain by now. Woo! <laughs> yeah, baby! Did you find me a big one? 
No way! Are you serious? Holy crap! Well done! <laughs> well you. done! Yeah! That's unbelievable! Isn't it? Wow! Flow lines. Roll over lip. Wow, look at that. Fusion crust, it's so thick. Yeah, sometimes you find a rock and you go, is it a meteorite or is it? Yeah. No question with this. No question. And this isn't just a meteorite. This is a new meteorite. This is new to science. This is a new discovery. It's about as good as it gets. The sun is beginning to set, and Steve and Jeff can't risk navigating out of the Atacama Desert in the dark. <coughs> Sorry about the dust. Their trip to Chile was a great success after finding a huge haul from the Montaraki Crater and now a gorgeous find in San Juan. Steve and Jeff head back to the States. The guys take a sample of their new find to meteorite specialist, Dr. Mike Zelensky. Hello. Oh, Greetings. Hello. Come on in. <laughs> Dr. Zelensky, he's a brilliant meteorite scientist, and we especially like him because he's a field guy. He gets out, looks for meteorites, as well as working in the lab as an academic researcher. So what's your theory on how so many meteorites could be found in such a tiny area? Yeah, although it might take thousands of years for a meteorite, two meteorites to land in the same place, over hundreds of thousands of years, you expect many meteorites to fall. So over a long period of time, you would expect to find lots of meteorites. But most places, they would weather away because water, wind, animals, plants will cause them to erode. But as you know, in the Atacama, yeah. you have no plants. You have almost no animals. You have almost no water. It might rain once every 20 years. And the winds aren't that severe. And so meteorites just land and just sit there for a long, long time. And so you have the accumulation area, just like in the Antarctic, where over hundreds of thousands of years, New York's just landing and they're not going anywhere. They're just, they're just sitting there. No, and so I, that's, they're not from the same fall. They're from many different overlapping falls over a really long period of time. So the most likely explanation is no more meteorites fell at San Juan than anywhere else in the world. It's just the conditions are perfect to preserve them for millennia. And that's why we see so many in one place. Yeah, wow. Meteorite in here now. This is a meteorite, the new meteorite you found in, in Chile from the San Juan Strun Field, um, or the recovery uh -huh. area. Today, we get to find out from Dr. Mike, what the classification of this find is. Is it a new meteorite to science? Is it paired with one of the many other meteorites that were found in San Juan? And so all is about to be revealed. By looking at the minerals in this mirror, we can tell it's an ordinary chondrite. And in fact, it's an L5 ordinary chondrite. Okay. The classification's done. It is an L5 chondrite. It's definitely a real meteorite. And it may fascinatingly be paired with San Juan 001, the very first meteorite ever found in that strewn field. And if so, it shows that there are definitely multiple meteorites that fell at the same time. The San Juan find, combined with their Montaraki impactites and shale, means that Jeff and Steve had a very successful trip for a grand total of $14,000 in fines. expeditions, it really is a money thing. If we're going to spend $5,000 or $10,000 to go somewhere, we'd like to make that money back and make a profit. And then sometimes you're just happy to bring a trophy home. Overall, I'm really excited. Anytime you find a new meteorite, it's it's like a wrapped Christmas present, and you don't know what you're going to find inside. We scored. We scored. 